Yo, 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 this is the Defiance Open Metaverse show. We have Mr. Simon One on the show today as well. But if you're watching this on replay, don't be shy. Put a message in the comments. If you're joining us on the stream, chat. We want to hear what you have to say because there's lots to talk about today. I am, of course, a fox. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Welcome back. It's good to have you, man. It's nice to be back. I've had a little hiatus and uh, the NFT crypto world has gone even more mental. Even oh more crazy, even more stupid, me. and you appear to have grown fox ears. You kind of have an androgynous, I'm going to say sexy, sexy Shut NFT it. base. Shut right. it. You're hot. I want to hear it. I You're hot. Yes. Oh, um, this is an NFT, believe it or not, and I've got it rigged up in a program called VTube Studio. Now, I don't know if you remember this one. You were the one that was like pushing me to be like, dude, you've got to be a VTuber. You've you got to do it. Got it's the weirdest subculture, man. It's it is best. weird. It's I, 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 yes. It's full of like women who are men and men who are women, and like you don't know which is which, and like it could be a man, could be a woman, who knows? And and like the manga thing is, but what I love about this culture is like the people who are really into this, they go so deep in like trying to f hack together a solution to to allow you to do stuff because the the software that comes in it's usually Japanese and it makes no sense at all. And then they kind of figure out a way to do things and then they share it all and it, it, like your OBS workarounds and everything else. But this thing is, well, this is, you know, th this works. Uh, are you, winking? Can, are you it, winking at me on purpose or is no, it a glitch? It, it's, well, basically, I've got, a, I've got a camera on me at the moment and it's reading my, my, my body, my body, my body. Uh, and I can kind of bring out the UI here. And you can see sort of what's going on. So I can I can select from a different model. So I could be a cat or whatever this one is. It's very easy to download the model from the Anata website, and then you just load it in. And then you've got settings that you can change. Um, so I you can see here the the way the AI is mapping my face. Um, so I don't know if you ever used like Deep Face Live or anything like that. The, yeah. the the software will basically take your head, stabilize it in the center of the frame, and then it will start tracking features that it knows our features. And you can see my hands kind of being mapped there as well. So uh, just Not for the audience and, and me, so is it a LiDAR based or is it just simply visual? No, no, it's pure visual. It's just using so that's AI. Crazy. That's models. crazy it's, how, how, how uh, accurate it can be by just using what is essentially a 2D image. Well, people's faces generally are pretty recognizable. So a nose and, and eyes, when you turn to the to profile, it gets a lot harder for an AI to understand that it is in, that, in fact a face. I so like your eyeball get... lasers. Do it to three quarters because the eyeball lasers are... <laughs> eyeball chopsticks. There's your new uh, NFT. Yeah, 10, that, that, hand unique tracking, the hand tracking is pretty, pretty spot on. Like we've been, we worked with like the magic, uh, the leap controller, which is like 10 years old now, but it, it, it's, I mean, it's okay. And like, we've got these stretch sense gloves, which are like hardcore motion capture gloves that we're going to be using for Unreal Engine. And that's pretty. That's pretty sick. But I tell you I mean, what, I've got. I've got. A I've got a little throwing balls in there. So I want you to, or someone to invent a working physical physics-based saxophone, and see if we can get the finger tracking intricate enough to play a saxophone using the fingers. That would be pretty. Yeah, they're working on it. So, so mapping instruments into uh, Unreal Engine is. is it's not straightforward. So the, the, there are basically control rigs for, for setting up like uh, a keyboard that is one-to-one -one mapped with a virtual keyboard in Unreal Engine. And, and like, it takes a lot of time because if you've got like 88 keys, that's a mm. lot of work. But like something like a guitar, which we, we have, which also has MIDI output, which can then be controlling other things on in the scene, in the engine, that's pretty cool. And then Ableton integration, everything is basically programmable if you mm. have, the, the patience to for it to not work most of the time well so, i mean that's partly the exploration what i want to see is a is, is 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 a youtuber avatar based version of the beatles where you just say okay create we can invent instruments and <laughs> see what shit they come up with it'd be interesting and awful awful for the years but you never know well this is the way, man. Like user-generated content is going to be AI-generated content with a little bit of user dabbage in there. That's basically going to be the way we go. Uh, we've got tons of stuff to talk about. Uh, let me let me do this properly. So these are the Anatas. We've done that. I want to give a shout out to these guys, Soul Savvy. This is an NFT sneaker. These are real kicks that you can uh, you can actually forge them. So you can buy the NFT, and now you can actually get the real sneaker. 
and I uh, suddenly like overnight almost I become like a sneakerhead. I, I don't know how it happened, but like I I got my first pair of artifact forged uh, Jeff Staple sneakers about three months ago, and that was pretty cool. But I it, yeah, there you go. You're a, you've always been a sneakerhead. These are nine. These are 1971 reissue. So these are the first. I mean they're they're. Their remakes, but they come with an excellent gold-plated Diamante <laughs> nice swoosh on them. So but the is thing it... is, it's cool. It's like, okay. Oh, I've lost the 1971 it. issues, and you're like, look at the state of this shit. It's just, it's just foam. It's just foam. In the 70s. Oh, yeah. yeah it's just, I mean, because it didn't have the tech. It's if it rains, you're in deep shit. You're dead. You're so, dead. yeah, I'm all yeah, about yeah. the sneakers. Yeah, man. So... Yeah, for some for some reason, it's it's just happened that I, I kind of just I'm I'm all over these things now because I feel like sneakerheads and sneaker culture maps really well with NFTs and collectibles. There, there's a kind of perception of the the craft and the value that goes into these things, and if you get like a real wearable version of it, that's pretty cool. So the, the kings of this are obviously um, artifact. Uh, I had hoped to have my inventory here to show. So the monolith opened up on artifact, and inside, oh, I have to do this. Okay, hopefully now we're good. So there, there, there is some model of, uh, artifact shoes. These are digital. These are the Nike Dunk Genesis Crypto Kicks. Ba boom, ba boom. And Thank then you get is. this vial. So you've got these skin vials, and you can um, basically dress your sneaker and equip it with a vial. So there's the human vial. It's kind of nice. And then there's the demon one. Ooh, smoky flame time. I like that. I like the horns. Here's the angel one. I like that even better. I like that even better. Uh, let's see. Yeah. We've got a robot one somewhere. That's kind of Bayonetta. We need some Bayonetta kicks. Robot. Have I got a robot anywhere? Uh, it doesn't look like I do. Oh, no. There it is. There's the robot. So that's the robot one. Nice. And then here, here's, here's, here's the mad puppy. This is the Murakami one. That's that's cute. That is that's cute. Sweet. I mean, Murakami is like uh, it's a, bit of a bit of an OG super designer i mean we can't be far off i mean we've got e-ink we've got we've got flexi screens we can't be far off having animated changeable transferable artwork on yeah on, but the on, cost, on the cost of production is going to be fairly primitive like one of ones like prototypes that they might do because the artifact have done like uh cyber no one gives a shit people drop in three hundred thousand for right? your basic board ape they can spend 10 grand on a pair of shoes yeah with, with, exactly with so, you, so you can equip the vial to the sneaker and so it's combined and these things evolve. I want as well. those. So I want like one, those. Two, three stages of evolution for these sneakers, for these crypto kicks. And that's, I mean, I think it's pretty cool. I, I'm, I think we're definitely going to see some more interesting sneaker combos, sneaker variations, sneaker, mm. uh, you know, sneaker head style drops for these things. I was watching an episode of Entourage, like Turtle. Well, yeah, Turtle, mad, get, Turtle mad. gets those. those... Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's just, he just wants the kicks, and like I've forgotten how important that was in street culture just completely forgotten but and here we are and it's back and that's why i think artifacts are such a they're so on the money with what yeah. they're doing in the i mean uh, not, not i mean i'm there's, there's a lot of things that i feel bad about but one of the things i feel bad about is not getting in artifact i mean it's mainly because i couldn't i, I couldn't pronounce the name so i was like well I, artificate and i was like oh yeah shit i remember as you said on the show it's an artifact i was like i'm a massive moron but yeah i think for for, for new players to the game the, the barrier to entry unfortunately yeah it's, 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 be it's, out, it's out of reach it's out of reach but so if you look at yeezys people are spending four five six thousand twenty thousand on yeezys which are essentially a two dollar bullshit sock from china with with the with shit logos on and yeah, i even i got sucked in i looked at the secondary market which is we're talking legacy retail here but the secondary market for used yeezys still about five six hundred pounds this is yeah. a sock shoe that is actually dog shit that second hand has been used by someone else so that's innovation my friends that's yeah, literally it's, what it's it is genius is what Speaking it is of innovation, in the world's best segue what about these long or short NFTs, NFT Purp is a perpetual futures dex for NFTs. What? What? You probably don't realize heck? why this is so profound. Can you? Can you, you guess? Can, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm sure you're gonna tell me immediately. Well, trading NFTs sucks. Basically, yep. uh, no one wants because let's be honest, no one wants a thousand bullshit things that aren't worth anything. 
Well, and also because it's really difficult. It's really difficult to trade them and it's really difficult to get fair pricing and it's really difficult to understand what the market is doing because you have no information and people just race in. And, and I remember when the first DEXs turned up, that was basically what it was like. You were trading tokens with like the worst lag. It would take ages. Were they midnight runners? <laughs> Possibly. So the, the NFT perp platform hasn't really launched yet, but it's going to. And the reason it's so profound is because you can short NFTs. And wow, this is... So the, so the innovation here is like BitMEX. BitMEX is like, it's a perpetual future innovation where you buy $1 of a, of a token that represents a share on Bitcoin, like $1 worth of Bitcoin. And then you can short it or long it uh, with leverage. And that basically means that people can go long or short board Apes uh, or Azukis in this case without actually owning a board Ape or an Azuki. And there have been some synthetic derivatives of this before, but this is tracking the floor price of these collections and it means that for instance if we click to the pro mode when apes went up like they did all the way up here this was a prime shorting opportunity but of course there was no way to short apes because they're not tokens in the normal yeah. sense of things unless you have if you have a if you have a token a synthetic token that represents the floor price and you short that then you are gaining exposure to that short side of the market and, and there's lots of reasons why you, you might want to do this if you own an ape and you know it's going to lose its intrinsic value because of the um, just the way the market is, you could hedge that loss by shorting against yourself, and you know you you could come out with a profit on the other side of it, and your ape will hopefully go back up in value. So the, the, these secondary utilities that accrue to these assets are things that you don't necessarily want to give up, but you still want to you know exploit the price differentials between you know, these different catalysts that occur naturally mm. in these markets. So this is a way of doing it without giving up the asset itself. That's why it's profound. And also, if you hate these things and you want to see them burn to the ground, then you can also make money off that bet, by which you are not able to do at the moment. You can simply go on Twitter and vent your schadenfreude in a public forum and everyone will hate you. And that's basically, <laughs> you know, the way crypto works. Yeah. I was speaking to this guy, I met a mic. He's the innovation lead at Verst Digital. Verst Digital is a it's a, a metaverse virtual production type studio thing, um, and he was talking about this M3 home space. So I took a look at it, and here it is. Nice. So this is an interactive space in 3D. This guy here, this is XR Devlog. This guy, absolute legend. So basically, the, what we're talking about on this show is like trying to connect up the nasty little bits and pieces to make the metaverse actually work. And a lot of that's to do with interoperability and file formats and all this kind of stuff. But this guy is really doing a lot to turn things that shouldn't talk to each other into things that can talk to each other through. Well, that is the final piece, really. Also, just big shout to the uh, fat, sweet Bud Vendor Machine nugget juice there. Because there that you is go. a big and it's part mad, of the joy. Mad dank nugs. There they go. Uh, so you Dang can click nice. on like, okay, so let's click on the Meta Factory, mm -hmm. and then the Meta Factory website pops up in the browser, and we can interact on it. So you can scroll through the website. Uh, Meta Factory is a clothing brand that's connected yeah. to Web three things. Is this is this two D based or is this? Can you jump in VR because this this looks I like it's perfect know. for VR. I don't know. So you, I mean, I haven't. Oh look, I've 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 managed to get a. Uh, a point there and you can click on these things oh yeah look at, uh, uh, earn uh, earn that uh, score uh, numbers uh, up numbers up. Uh, 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 uh. okay that's enough oh shit let me do that so anyway you get the idea uh yep. it's definitely worth checking out i mean it's not the most amazing thing in the world but it is 3d it's a different kind of web experience it's and... somewhere to put your things and somewhere to look at stuff i mean that is that it is one of the is. it is and that is a game boy we we love a game boy you know yeah it's we not do. that much fun sitting on open sea, just looking at floor prices and going, oh, God, why didn't I get that? This is way more I, fun. I know, right? So the next one is my pet hooligan. What I've noticed recently is that there's just a lot more kind of games and things going on. Hmm. And they're actually playable because a lot of projects have been promising a game and they don't deliver anything. But these guys appear to have a game that seems to be maybe quite fun. They actually are a gaming studio. Uh, so you're going to be able to play this game and run around and shoot and everything else. But I mean, that looks nice. Yeah, kind of fort, I mean, who, dude, who knows? Who mm. knows? It's very easy to make a shit game. We know this. So this mm. is my pet hooligans. Uh, they call them interactive NFTs. I don't really know why they're interactive, but there is an app that you can download that will allow you to perform as the character itself. Uh, I didn't try it out because I was doing the Anathis today, but uh, that was, thought that was interesting. Next one I'm going to look at is Aurori. 
they just released a gameplay trailer uh, for a game that you can actually play. Do you fancy playing it? Yeah, of course. This is a Solana-based um, NFT project with its own game. I mean, I, I, uh, who knows? It looks a lot like Pokemon. Pokemon. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's Pokemon. Battler, I mean, Pokemon's, it? Pokemon's not that successful, though, is it? I mean, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, I still, so I actually, still see people playing Pokemon Go. You get these groups of people. You think, hang on, it's like, why, 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 why are you stood around? Oh yeah, my, my kids love it. My kids love they it. Love it. Although they've actually click, got oh, mad just click, Roblox. Click, click back to that um, frame you had with the WASD key set up because. Oh, I can't. No, never mind. Now, now I have to traverse. Ne- I have to traverse the Nexus to reach the Takani. The and next like, evolution I, of I these fight sticks fight. from Furin are going to be WASD based. So, trust me, when they drop, it's going to change the game. I, mean, I, yeah, I, I can't I can game. move my, my, my cursor around, but I can't do anything. Now I get to a box. I can press and I can move the box. Wow. It's oh. a beautiful looking game. That looks nice. It looks like it. Um, Revol- yeah, you know, Dev- uh, Revolver, the, Bastion. Look it looks like, look at the feet. looks like Bastion. Look at the feet. Yeah, you're just hovering but, above the ground. Look at that. Y- yeah, but come on, you look at any basic phone game, you're looking at five million development. Look, this is a basic that... phone game. So no, can... but I'm saying, don't. Oh, look, don't give uh, me... this is an exchange, so I can swap my tokens. No, thank you. That's and cute. Then, well, then where can I go? I can, I can go around here. What's this? Smash a barrel. Oh, uh, dude, I'm bored already. <laughs> I'm so bored. Like, where am I going? It's very pretty. Oh, oh there's oh. Oh, see, that's like Bastion. That's Bastion. And Bastion is brilliant. I can't even jump. Or can I? I just missed it. So this is, this is, oh, look, coming soon. That's it. That's the end of it. I can't, I can't even throw myself off the edge in frustration. That's a nice little demo. It's all right. It's all right. No, and that does nice. b- basically bring us to the final piece of the puzzle, which is Webiverse, who we're going to be talking about today. Um, they've got a little portal, which looks a lot nicer, if I'm honest. I don't actually know what you can do with this, so I'm going to wait for the the, the human that actually is from Webiverse to tell us what we can do here. Well, but it's, it's basically open source, man. Sand, it's, yeah, sandpit open source games. Come on, it's good. It's it's a fully open source, open license web metaverse. And I, I keep coming across this. So that guy Jin, he's doing a lot of um, work with these guys, and basically it's a set of open standards um, for everything to allow you know full transmission of ideas and creativity and assets across the metaverse wherever you are whoever you are no matter what and i think that translation engine whatever it ends up being is it's like it's super important right yeah and it's super complicated and someone else is going to have to develop it <laughs> what's your what's your all-time favorite game oh god um last of us oh yeah good chat good chat yeah good but chat. For, I, I, for I heard them... it i heard it was it was an, a, a really quite soul-destroying experience playing that game in terms of the visceral emotions that you feel for the characters yeah i mean i cried so hard i i've made everyone play it that's got a ps4 uh, my brother made me play it. he sat down and made me play it um but then what i'm playing a lot lately is um switch just because i'm always on i'm on the move i don't necessarily have my pc set up or, or a console i've got a switch i'm playing a lot of two three hour roguelite roguelite games um and I just love it. It's just it's it's kind of they've got that 80s neon look, but with the modern modern you know develop development cycle, so that they are clever. It, it's not just a, a game that's going to kill you. They're, they're rewarding. Bayonetta is also, I guess, Bayonetta, Street Fighter, Last of Us. I think they're going to be my favorite games. I mean, the, the the Street Fighter community is still massively going strong, right? How how 100%. high ranked were you on Street Fighter? Oh you, God. You, um it was it was it was 90s top 100 top 100 on, on, on street fighter 4 yeah you mentalist yeah um but you i'm with someone now actually mentalist. um so the guy that, that runs fury in ik which makes these is a competitive street fighter third strike player okay oh wait wait you can't just just hold that up hold it up properly and show the folks at home what that is look at this beautiful thing what is that exactly? It's a fully customizable fight stick with 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 Samar parts. Um, just, just waggle the joystick around. Let's let's hear that. Listen to listen to this. Oh, oh, oh! But what 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 he's bringing out next is 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 like I say, I'm not I'm not I'm not joking. It's literally it's like Walkman to iPod. It's the most beautiful unit you've ever seen. Um, and for fight st- fight games, but also with the WASD controllers and like custom setups, you can you play any game with it. And it also comes with a, obviously a, 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 a pie, a 
Raspberry Pi inside driving it all. So the, oh, yeah. so the one I've got has um, May Marquet cabinet, which has 40,000 games on it. Took me an hour and a half just to scroll through the fucking menu. Oh, my God. I've got every game in the universe oh. up until about PS2. Even yeah, that, even the LCD Nintendo game and watches on it. I'm like, gee. Oh, man. It, 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 if, you've, if you've never seen it, there's a, a, an amazing clip of... Um, the the dude from uh, from Unreal Engine from um, Epic Games, Tim, what's his face? And, and it's uh, MTV Cribs, and he's showing around his house, and it's just like, well, I don't really know why I've got such a big house, uh, but basically, uh, you know, in the old days, we used to just code a game of you know, like a weekend, uh, uh, but things are a little bit more complicated now. Yeah, You're like, they are. oh, oh, god, yeah, it, it's um. It's kind of funny just to see how how many games you can fit on like just a, a tiny little thing. Well, um, for Sweeney, comparison, so like Tim Sweeney, yeah, um, yeah, Tim Sweeney. So, so Super Mario 3D, which changed the game in terms of 3D camera control, the immersive stuff. Um, the ROM for that is seven megabytes. <laughs> compressed ROM, seven, <laughs> seven megabytes. You get more. I think I think a single hair on Solid Snake's head was like 50 meg. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, okay. I I found the clip. Hang on. Uh let's do this properly. So this is Tim Tim Sweeney and his house. Can you hear that? I never really expected to meet a successful island to game development. Yeah, yeah. A really big house. I don't know why I have a big house. I don't really need it. I don't use much of the space. Um but I figured you know I have the money, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I have the money. I'm, the, I'm thinking I have the money. Why not? It's so good, and it's just the most awkward thing. Like you got Tim, like just wandering around his house, there's dog food, and there's like this is like one of the richest, most powerful men in, like one of the biggest voices in the metaverse. Total dork. I mean, does he really need a mock Tudor kitchenette? <laughs> no, the guy just made so much money, like out of nowhere. That really was the geeks in Heritage of the Earth. Absolutely nuts. Well, Unreal is the new fucking. I don't know what would you call blood. Of the have, world, you done really. any, have you done any mocap stuff in films or TV yet? Not, not for I have, but not for broadcast or anything like that. Test stuff I've done, yeah. Um, and my my brother has done as well. I mean, that's what he did a degree on was actually animation. So, um, but you've done voices for games though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which game, which games did you voice? Uh, I did a lot of work for Total War. Um, Total War. Total War, the Chinesey one. I can't. Uh, Total War. <laughs> The uh, three kingdoms three kingdoms yeah i played one of the main characters and then just a load of others <laughs> it was you know they just the chinese ones but then there's loads of stuff i've been i've been um taping for quite a few different games i can't i've nda'd the whole lot of them oh yeah uh, i'm yeah. actually i'm i voiced one of the trailers actually one of the so this one oh this is the one i voice yeah yeah nice um Oh no! This is a, a month, but I do, I do, I do it live. In the old days, all of the things were dangerous: killing and swords and men flipping. Oh, no, no. It was basically that's what it was. But like thousands <laughs> of thousands. Of lines. I, th I think that'd be about two thousand lines of dialogue. And one of the ones was uh, so a little bit toast of Tinseltown. It's like right. So what do we what up next? I need you to. Uh, I need you to act like you've been shot with an arrow, fall off a horse, but you realise you're okay, <laughs> and then you need to rally the team. <laughs> just can you, can, you guys, can, you, can you do that in one sound? <laughs> and, like, there's a fiery yeah. hawk. There's yeah, a I mean, fiery yeah. hawk that's coming. Okay, it's like, listen, man. It's too um, specific. It's a little bit specific. Well, listen, our, our first guest is here. It is Ahan from the Webiverse. We talked briefly about the Webiverse before, but I'm very excited to get him on. But before we can get to that, we have to hear from our sponsors. We left Earth and settled the cosmos. Our greatest accomplishment became our downfall. Our struggle for freedom would last nine decades. Warriors emerged and made the ultimate sacrifice. In the final battle at Mew 36, we achieved victory. But it would be centuries before we would know the cost. Learn our story. This is only the beginning.
Is your crypto sitting idle without earning you any passive income? On Nexo, you can maximize the value of your crypto in no time and earn rates of up to 17%. Their web platform and mobile app are super easy to use. You can buy crypto with cards instantly and start earning interest paid out daily. The Nexo exchange has over 300 market pairs. Every time you swap or buy crypto, you get up to 0.5% cash back that's automatically added to your wallet. If you want to finance buying a car or a trip to a faraway place, you can borrow cash by using your crypto or NFT as collateral. You don't lose your crypto and you can get borrowing rates as low as 0% APR. Nexo has over 4 million users worldwide and their platform is equipped with a top quality security infrastructure designed to ensure maximum protection of assets at all times. Go to nexo.io and get started today. NFTGo.io is an all-in-one NFT platform to help you find everything you need to know about the marketplace. Hungry for data? Get informed on market sentiments, upcoming collections, data of top collections, and even the behaviors of the biggest whales around. There's always something more you can learn about any specific collection, like the price trend of that collection you have, who co-owns the project with you, and their trading habits. It's all right there. And it even helps you find the lowest price on the market for you to make an informed decision, which, let's face it, is a big helping hand. Check out nftgo.io today. Yeah, that's mental. That's a bit of a, oh, look, you're in VR. Just check in. So um, I just want to flag Ignatius Demonda is the coolest name I've ever read uh, on anything. Ignatius like Demonda. Ignatius Demonda. We have a young man by the name of Ahad. How do you pronounce your name, sir? Um, Ahad is fine. Ahad is Ahad fine. Is fine. Yeah, uh, Ahad, how you doing? This is Simon I'm doing Wines. great. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Beautiful to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to talk everything Webiverse. I think basically, why don't you why don't you explain to us what the Webiverse is on the, on the whole project? Sure. Um, actually, uh, I think it'll be good for me to start with my own story, and then from there, you know, it'll be a natural transition to start, start from the day you were born. <laughs> no. So uh, basically, uh, product experience, got into crypto in 2014. Um, through my work, as well as I was involved with uh, in the space, I could see the super cycle of metaverse, which was coming. So I got interested in the space. And at that time in 2020, 2021, a lot of practical writings were coming out from Webiverse uh, on what metaverse should be. Uh, and there was this one particular demo, which... Uh, now my co-founder, Avier, did, uh, which I saw in, in that demo, what he does is basically, he does it in VR, uh, but what he does is that he goes from one game to other, and these are mainstream games like VR Chat, uh, Minecraft, No Man's Sky, and he's just like transporting from one game to the other, uh, and uh, he's using uh, inventory items as 3D NFTs, and this is like two years ago, right? As 3D NFTs and like socializing with people, uh, and I was blown away, right? Like, I was like, wow, this is like interesting. And like the talk was named um, Free Association in the Metaverse. Uh, and uh, basically, that's how I got involved with Webverse. Uh, now, I'm one of the co founders, I look after, you know, the organization, the marketing aspect uh, of it, uh, whereas Avia is more focused on the product. Um, at the core of what we are trying to do with Webverse is we're trying to build. I know it sounds a bit crazy, it sounds a bit sci-fi, but we're trying to build the foundations of a fun, interoperable virtual worlds, which we believe that, you know, on these foundations, these virtual worlds will be built. Uh, so what does it translate into? It translates into that we have built our own game engine uh, on the web. Why we have built it on the web? Because we believe the web is the most democratic medium. Uh, and, you know, at that time, when uh, Avery used to tell me that we'll build like an open world game within the browser, it will have VR, it will have AR. I was like, come on, get out of here. You know, that's that's not happening. Uh, but yeah, that's what we have, you know, done. Uh, the game engine layer, it's the most feature packed engine in terms of the web. Uh, we have like full combat, uh, some of the features we have been shipping. Uh, so, you know, like Fortnite style, Prince of Persia kind of uh, uh, full, uh, uh, combat, then we have WebXR support as well. So which means that, you know, it's just a URL. It opens in the browser. Uh, if you open it on laptop, you can later open it on your mobile as well. 
and then uh, you can open it in VR as well. And if you open it in VR, it's a full 360 immersive experience. Um, on top of the game engine layer is a platform layer. So that pa platform layer is for user-generated content. These user-generated, so it's kind of like Roblox, uh, Minecraft. So these user-generated content can be avatars, weapons, wearables, vehicles. Everything can just like be simply drag and drop. We have built with the concept of everything on open standards uh, and standard file format, just like a web page. So, you know, like in a web page, PNG and JPEG works everywhere. So we try to use those kind of um, uh, uh, open standards as well. And we have been advocating for them. Uh, everything in the world could be an NFT, whether it's an avatar, weapons, wearables. Uh, we, and then on top of the platform layer, uh, we are launching Upstreet. Uh, the Upstreet, the idea is that it's a, it's a sci-fi wacky place, um, which is, you know, built up of like, in which like creators and communities have their own world. Uh, and it's part of one large story, large immersive story, large meta game. Um, and these experiences, these individual experiences could be totally different in terms of the art style, in terms of the gameplay. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, these little experiences of yours, uh, you can token gate it. We also have our Discord board, which is like a 100x version of Collabland. Uh, you can use it for governance. You can run it on your, in your own servers. You don't even have to like run it in web or server. You can token gate your own uh, little world however you want. For example, you own an Anata NFT. You can say that, okay, all Anata holders are free to like travel here or like you can monetize the other holders as well. Uh, other uh, like non-Anata uh, um, users as well. Um, yeah, and I mean, the whole idea has been to build something which is, fun enough to qualify as a metaverse. So we have a lot of stuff, um, which is like, for example, text to speech, speech to text. Uh, we have a lot of AI features coming in as well, which is a lot of our focus. And when I say AI, uh, it's not just like the NPCs, uh, which includes like uh, natural language processing, like your NPCs can talk to you, et cetera. Uh, but it's also uh, stuff like uh, how we use AI for content generation and to build worlds, right? Uh, we think that, you know, AI is going to be a very important uh, feature in terms of metaverse. That's what's go going to make the metaverse interesting, right? Like, uh, if it's not interesting, there's no point. So, yeah, uh, everything we do is 100% open source. Uh, we do live development. Uh, we have, you know, we haven't done any dr NFT drop or land sale, etc. Because we believe that, you know, first we need to have a product. Uh, so, you know, that's what we've been doing, but even now, like a lot of people have been in engaging and you can see, you know, like some, how somebody has made like a doodles world, somebody's made like, uh, uh, clone X kind of stuff works in it, nouns, all of these things there. Right. Um, so yeah, that's like a quick overview. Happy. To, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff, but I'm sure it will come. Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to un unpack there, but it, it seems to me that we we've got these competing philosophies of what a metaverse is and what it could be and some of those are kind of pushing more towards social and some of those are pushing more towards you know allow the broadest section of people to be able to participate in whichever way they want to yeah i i feel like yours is is more like the roblox version of of the metaverse in the sense that it's 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 quite easy to get started and it's quite easy to just jump in there with with assets that you have and then find the, the, the standards that you need to just get going. Would that be fair? At a tech level, yes. But what Upstreet is, it's World of Warcraft means Roblox. So we have our own storyline. Uh, and uh, actually, we use AI for it. The whole idea is kind of like, if you look at a banner post, right, like you'll see like different NFT characters. Uh, we don't control the IP of that. Uh, but, you know, we have a very interesting experiment of like how we can weave the lores and stories together so that it can be part of one larger story. So it's kind of like the Marvel universe. It's kind of like, but it's more like an immersive universe, right? Um, Just a question on that. Like you said about sto stories being driven by AI, which is cool, but yeah. where the element of the auteur or the, the voice, I mean, how are you guys sort of um, confronting that? Because if you, if an AI is, 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 is you and you to generate story, surely there'll be a point where either everything becomes the same or it becomes a whole level of everything's great. I mean, where do you see the role of that? 
AI being the the Tarantino or the Tolkien or the J.K. Rowling, dare I mention her name, that that kind of thing, because um, to some extent, the human interaction in terms of in, in taste and, and style Will will that be sort of watered down? Do you think, or will it just will it just? Are you prepared to let it go anywhere and just we, we can cherry pick the best bits and kind of ignore the the AI world, which is just um, made of tomatoes and that's all it is. You know, you know what I mean, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So it depends on the interactions. Some of the interactions are such like that that you will not be able to distinguish if it's a human or if it's an AI unless it's flagged. Okay. Um, but the whole idea about us using AI is very different. It's not like to create an experience in which, you know, like AI and humans are in together. It's basically providing a tool for creators to build their own experience. Mm. So for example, in your own little world, you can define an AI bot and you can give it a certain task. You can give it a backstory. You can give it a lore. And then, you know, whoever is coming into its world, into your world, it operates that way. I love it because that gives you the option then for say I just I join your metaverse or your meta space or your your VR world and I just want to hang around with a thousand Spartan football hooligans that are all drunk and yeah. angry because their wives yeah. left them. You yeah. know, that yeah. can all be in. You can experience that. I mean that yeah. that's going to be cool because some people yeah. are going to want some weird shit. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know. So, and if you so, if you can just type the 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 phrases into the into the the interface and you know today I just want massive chickens to peck my eyes out. But every time they do it, I want to poop out NFT gold. <laughs> we can do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure like uh, people will be doing a lot of these things, but that's why you know the fair usage policy comes in. Uh, but like on a very serious note, it's it's a great tool for creators, uh, and we believe that you know it's going to usher a whole new uh, wave of creativity. I can give you one little example, and that will you know help you better understand. Um, Imagine creating a VR world for students to learn about physics. And when I say physics, at a very macro level, so it could be, you know, the galaxy, they can go in and, you know, basically they can see the whole Milky Way in a very immersive way, right? Like we have never seen the galaxy in such a way, but in VR, you can actually do it. Now at a micro level, you can come in and you can see the same interactions like protons, electrons, quarks, etc. in VR as well, right? That's the other use case. Now the third use case where AI comes in is that imagine you walk into a classroom and Richard Feynman is teaching you about physics, right? That is definitely very much possible, you know, with with the with the tech. Um, I want I want you know, Pamela Anderson you know, to teach me. <laughs> yeah. So even if you know, right, like that, it's it's it's. It's AI, right? Like you know, it's fake. But like Richard Feynman doing it in in a, in his very own quirky way, uh, that is a very different impact. So that's just one example. But uh, I think the core thing which we use AI is also not related just for the non-playable characters, but it's also related to how you bring everything in the world in a connected fashion. Mm. So. What I mean by that is, for example, your world is made up of different things, right? Like there's going to be a rock, there's going to be a tree, there's going to be, um, you know, a building, etc. We use the AI so that all of these things are read and made sense of in a holistic way. <laughs> so as a result of that, what happens is that, you know, like you can start generating worlds based upon certain traits and characteristics. Uh, and once you start doing that, then the reverse order effect of it is that your AI NPCs are also able to understand these words because these words are now defined, right? Like now it's just not like random things for them. They know it's a tree and a tree is in conjunction with a building. Then there's a building, there's a road. So, you know, that's where the very interesting aspect comes in. Because mm. at the very core, our idea was, and that is what I was, you know, very much attracted to Weberverse in the first place when I saw AVA, what he's trying to do. The idea is that, you know, like we talk about Metaverse and every, and people say that, you know, Metaverse is everything. It's the internet, Twitter is Metaverse. Yeah, all of that is fine. But like, realistically speaking, when we say about Metaverse, it is the sci-fi version of it, right? And the sci-fi version of it is not a boring game from the 90s, a pixelated boring game from the 90s, you know, in which like we're trying to like breed something and get something out of that, right? Like it has to be 
our definition is that it could be 2D as well, by the way. And we support. Mm. We well, support I think, I think, sorry to well. jump in. I think but there's, idea, there's, 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 go. Sorry. Yeah, no, so I was saying the idea is that we are going to move from these 2D text based interfaces to a more engagement based interface. And I'll give you a very small test for it. You go in any meetup, right? You ask people, what's your favorite computer application? They'll think for some time, somebody will say Twitter, somebody will say Discord, and they say, okay, what about games? Then you change the question and you say, what is your fondest memories of a computer application? Everyone will talk about games once yep. they know that games are included. What is the reason? It is a high engagement product design. Whereas mm. the products we use, for example, our utility products or our communication products like social media, they have been built on the concept of convenience. Yes. Very different mindset. So what we believe that in the next phase, the generations are more digitally native. You know, like Gen Z is even more digitally native than I am, right? So mm. for them, these high engagement based products comes natural to them. I mean, I have a 12 year old, uh, 12 month old uh, kid and, uh, you know, for him, a screen is a very natural thing. You know, like he can play around with a touch screen. It's playing grab that uh, auto, just yeah. causing havoc. <laughs> at, at 12 yeah. months old, right? Like whether it's a big, large screen, an iPad or phone or whatever, it, it's just, just a natural thing. So that what that's what the metaverse in my definition is. That, you know, a more engaging experience away from 2D text. And the other thing which I think will become important is that as human beings, as part of technology, you know, we have already solved long distance communication. But what is missing in this? What's missing is social presence, right? And social presence is a great factor. I mean, social presence is what you call a vibe, right? That's what mm -hmm. you feel in a church when the priest is giving the sermon. That's what you feel in a rave. That's what you feel in a club, right? So these social presence... <laughs> The social presence is definitely what we are going to, you know, like try to get more in our next generation of computer applications. So in WebOverse, the idea is that, you know, we give this platform and out of that, people can make educational stuff. They can make entertainment stuff. They can make social stuff. You know, these are three and probably at some point in time, they'll make like pure financial stuff as well. Right. Um, but the core belief is that we are going, unless we stop progressing, we are definitely going to move away from these rectangular 2D text-based mediums to a more engaging medium, right? It, which could be 2D as well, could be 3D as well, could be VR, could be AR, but that's why, you know, like metaverse tech becomes even more complicated and and because you have to target all of these different platforms and devices. Mm. So the, the way I see the AI thing is, <clears throat> We are very short of time, all of us. And the metaverse right. demands a sort of 24 hour cycle of engagement and, and AI fills in the gaps in many ways. And it will fill, up, fill in the gaps in ways that we never even thought would be possible. Correct. Correct. It's gonna allow the game to continue when we're not there. And it's gonna right. allow us to grind in the game and earn and, and fulfill tasks and do all these kind of things when we're asleep because we are unfortunately bound by the limits of our fleshy sleeves that we inhabit which is very i mean it's very very interesting but you've said so many intriguing things here about the way we engage with story worlds and everything else but you didn't mention story once which i thought was interesting but you you in your pitch about webiverse you were very sort of hot on the shared story experience but i, I yeah i think so much of what you're building because it's ugc it will be about the great storytellers in the community and i, yeah. I wonder if you're seeing them emerge at this point Hundred percent. We already are. I mean, if you look at our Twitter feed, um, we did a very, and it happened all organically in the community. So we have one of our lead characters. Her name is Silly. We haven't even de disclosed any detail about her. Like, it's just, Let me just, just like, is that is that her yeah. there? Yeah, right. that's yeah. So is, we haven't even disclosed about her, but of course she comes up in our post. She's part of our live, like like our live demo environment as well. She has one robotic arm. Um, and uh, what people started doing, and there are some tweets you can see, is that they started making stories in which their character is present and Silly is present. Fan fiction. 
yeah yeah um, and and it's like the crossover coming in right like uh, uh, and uh, uh like like one of these marvel uh crossover titles right um and that's what we are really excited about because you know every all of these nft communities i mean if not all i would say many of them have this lore have the story i mean you just like flashed the screen and i think a cyber broker came in right like very strong yeah. lore very yeah. strong storytelling um because at the end of the day what i personally believe that you know a metaverse is the collection of our imagination we have the power to like build a collection of our imagination and you know like it'll be interesting for like diversity for it to be exist and that diversity to converge at some point that's what we call the street that's why it's called up street you know because unlike i would say the platforms of web2 i think one problem with the platforms of web2 was that they were very generalistic as a result of it what happens was that of course you used to define the entire rules as well as the product for everyone because they were you know like global products the approach we want to take is that you know you have these community based little worlds which become part of one like they converge at one point which is the street and that's where everyone has to agree upon the the rules how they want right but within so their like own, a hub world correct but within their own worlds they can have they can define their own um governance and rules etc because you know people have different values for some people nudity is part of expression for some people nudity is ex- uh, offensive right so it's mm. important for like a product to exist in such a way that which gives people the freedom to be to form communities and at the same time these micro communities can converge and be part of the larger you know the the, the larger society this well, I like fight. it because it takes the experience away from a goal driven experience which is either leveling up which is making numbers bigger uh, defeating a boss which is just getting to the end of the thing too just a pure experience thing because you know imagine taking that character and 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 the parameters that you define are all of the birds can talk and it's just it could just be an experience where you're with your character and you're just chatting to birds and 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 then some of them are going to be successful some aren't some people are going to just luckily strike on something which which will just hit everyone deep and it could be something like searching for like um, digital geocaching maybe with you know in but on the, on the on a macro neutrino level think things like that um and I, I think it's good because there is a huge area of people that don't want to just literally start a game finish a game it's the experience you, you don't have to necessarily win and and the same in life if, we, if we're taking life to a to the next point whatever and i also think going back to what you said it's um you're getting nearer to holodeck you know this is i guess the dream of metaverse is the holodeck experience you know star trek yeah. did it you walk into the room um it's it's kind it's of i mean it's, right? like it's, it's getting there it's escapism right like at the end of the day you want to build something which has to be better other i mean i think real world is pretty dope uh, for me to like spend some time there the thing is that like when people think about metaverse like oh you're trying to like move people away from interaction i was like no you know we already spend like 12 hours in front of a screen i'm just trying to make it more interesting exactly um, and uh, regarding that basically upstreet will have first party experiences as well so we will have you know like the boss coming in and, and all of that as well but it's not a fixed objective so it progresses in seasons every season there is a development phase in which we basically help the creators and the communities build their own experience while we are building our own as well uh the whole idea is that you know we do live development and we guide people to build their own and then there is a gameplay phase in which you know everybody does it's kind of like a show production you know like a season production mm. uh it has a theme during the theme like interesting things start happening and then you know the season ends with a season end kind of a event a party kind of like fortnite and then you know the next season begins mm-hmm. um so that's the idea about upstreet the whole idea is that you know to keep it wild and experimental every season so that you're trying new things um also you know like when people say about the metaverse it's not like there's going to be like a def- defined line that you know this is 
not where the metaverse is and this is where the metaverse is. It's going to be a gradual transition. Eventually, we will be moving into much more immersive, socially present applications. Uh, but of course, like the next few years is going to be a gradual transition. Uh, one thing, though, which is important for us is the economy of the system, right? I think that uh, we already are seeing it, right? Like there is people are digital asset is a thing now, you know, like it is a recognized thing, uh, digital asset, digital ownership. Um, and at the end of the day, economy is just how much people are building and how much people are consuming, right? Mm. Trade, trade and uh, production. So that's something which we definitely want to like very actively support. And in terms of development, it's going to be worlds, it's going to be the quest, the experiences which people build on these worlds. Uh, because the more they are there, the more there's the economy aspect of it, right? Mm. Which is what we want to uh, promote. I, I have a feeling GPT-3 is built into this somewhere. Oh, 100%. I mean, GPT-3 is like, uh, GPT-3 is, uh, I mean, we use GPT-3, but we use other APIs as well, not just from OpenAI. Uh, but yeah, GPT-3 we use a lot, but we use other uh, AI uh, stuff as well. The, the whole social experience is, is really the thing. I have been on many occasions into Somnium, for instance, and, and Somnium in VR is, is a truly blow your mind, one of a kind experience for a metaverse. Yeah. But like, you have to go there at specific times a day to find the people who are there. And then it's this really strange experience of being with people, but you're not with them, with them at all. And you're kind of flapping around with some goggles on. And it, it, it's, it's genuinely a, a quite an odd experience. But like most of the time that I'm there, it's empty and it's sad because I think mm. it's 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 hard for people to get to Somnium because of the the hardware requirements and that kind of thing. But I think the there's no doubt that the the thing that made like the Travis Scott Fortnite concert so amazing <laughs> was that social experience. And I think we even just making content, we realize that what people want to see is not just me talking to them; they want to feel that there's a bunch of people that make the stuff and see a little bit of that and hear you know see the peanut gallery and this kind of thing and and i i'm having to reconfigure the way that i create content and the way i think about how we make entertainment in terms of being much rougher and much more kind of keen to show the underneath i spent so much of my life getting really good at hiding the joins and now actually the thing that people value the most is the seams and being able to see how something was made it's a really yeah. weird thing to kind of unlearn all that stuff and, and think open source and pretty much all the touch points that you have when you communicate, when you are thinking about entertainment. But I mean, I think the, the biggest question for me in all of this is like, it, it, how robust is the interoperability? And, and for it to work, you need people to really adopt it, right? So Correct. you need to be evangelical in a sense about how you communicate that and how you get the word out. Correct. So... See, first of all, interoperability is also a journey uh, and there's no magic recipe for it. So the first aspect of it is to very strictly use standard file formats. And the second aspect of it is that you don't do anything custom on your platform. So you're basically giving people the right to exit as well. Whatever they build on WebOverse, they can just take and they can go anywhere they want. You know, they also have the ability to host it on blockchain, right? So it's not even on our database. So they can take it and they can go and they didn't make anything specific for us. Um, for interoperability to exist, I think some good projects need to establish it and it can very much exist. There is nothing stopping it at all. You know, it's like one of those things, for example, um, if you look at... Uh, like, why can you not make a phone call between a WhatsApp and a Telegram? There's nothing stopping it technologically, you know, like these, the reason is because these are separate entities and they have decided for profit maximization that they will operate that way, right? So it is a human coordination issue as well. It's not just a tech issue. I think the tech part is already solved. Like you can use standard file format um, as long as like, and that's what we want to do first at a WebOverse level is that, you know, like these different experiences which are there, which could be different, right? Like one could be a voxelized experience, one could be a non-voxelized experience, one could be a high fidelity experience, one could be a low fidelity experience. 
in future, one could be a 2D experience, one could be a 3D experience. So for example, we already have uh, the proof of concept for a 3D to 2D interoperability. So what we do is we take the avatar, we take like we convert it into a sprite sheet, and you can take the same avatar, you can take the same invent identity, and you can travel between a 3D world to a 2D world with the same inventory as well. Right. See, that's uh, this is something very exciting because my dream for, for the I hate the word metaverse and I hate the word NFTs, but for the metaverse <laughs> is to be able to take my 2D character that I'm using in a 1991 Street Fighter 2 emulation, take my Ryu custom and then whack him into a maybe a, a Forza game, which is a 4K yeah. running at 60 frames a second. Yeah. Um, and, I, and then I want to take that character and I want to stick him on my Twitter PFP. Yeah. And he can be his own thing. I mean, how close and how difficult do you think it will be until there is a consensus between IPs? Because in traditional gaming at the minute now, companies hold on. To, like you say, there's no reason why we can't phone from uh, Instagram to WhatsApp. But like getting, say, Solid Snake into Super Mario. Actually, that, that's actually happened with Smash Brothers. But how far, yeah. how close do you think we are to a consensus with that in terms of the, the, the powerhouses? Or do you think they'll just have to concede and say, look. We're going, to, I think we're going to come year, on board with you. I think next year we'll start seeing some results of it. I already know a few projects uh, who are trying to do collab because the metaverse is a reality now, right? Like in terms of funding, in terms of public attention, in terms of public focus. Uh, and you can't just keep on producing game from the 90s and, you know, just like slap crypto economy on top of it and just introduce some tokens. Like, mm. I mean, the Ponzi can only last that long. Let's be real, you know, like uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're smart uh, creatures uh, and, you know, everyone will be looking for, okay, what is the metaverse hype, right? Like all the investors, whether they're retail investors, whether they're institutional investors, they're going to be start asking some real questions, right? <laughs> like um, you can't just like <laughs> produce game from 2000s and 90s and, you know, like just keep on s slapping some crypto elements to it. Uh, interoperability. <laughs> <laughs> and interoperability as you said right like uh it is exciting right like that's the exact same demo which i saw i was like okay shit like mm. this thing makes sense otherwise like you hear this metaverse hype and you're like i don't know what they're, they're making game okay fine i mean you know i played much better games so you know like these games don't even look great <laughs> so i think uh, yeah, we, we, we looked we looked at some earlier <clears throat> But we're gonna have to let you go soon because we have got Matty from yeah. uh, from Metakeys. But what did you make of the other side? You must have looked into that that the whole drop. What, what did you make of their play here? Because it's pretty kind of heavily VC backed with all of the baggage that comes with that. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm, and diplomatic uh, and improbable. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, will have something up their sleeves. I tried to actually look up what Improbable's tech is. Uh, I couldn't find that. So well, it's proprietary, right? So all the M squared stuff, that's all highly proprietary with their no, interoperable but, metaverses I mean, and all the massive, massively multiplayer networking stuff. It's all proprietary. Uh, the proprietary stuff is fine, but I, I couldn't even find like a blog on it, right? That what exactly it is. Um, so I, I really don't know. Uh, my well, there's, only... there's, there's a ton uh, of SoftBank money in it. That's, that's for sure. So yeah. My, my only criticism to the other side thing is that I don't, I wouldn't have expected um, uh, yoga and like Animoca and even Improbable. I don't think they needed to do um, a drop on just a concept art. I mean, they had enough funds. They could have, you know, like actually done the production and then they could have done the drop. Uh, that's my only question mark, but um, well, you have to feed the beast. This is the thing. It's you have to feed the beast. Yeah, it's a timing thing. So there's a there's a natural rhythm to when they drop things, and it's quarterly. So you you could feel that like they needed to deliver something. Uh, and they, they I think they were falling behind in the initial phase, which is why the dogs happened. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, the, there's an SDK which is designed to allow other projects to port their assets into the game in some form but i mean who knows what that's going to be it's certainly going to be a a very visible project and one which it might work it might not if it fails it'll be harmful for the rest of us but i just know that it's probably going to be one of the highest budget games in the world <clears throat> so i'm looking forward to it well that's that's a sobering thought isn't it i mean and on the other side we've got mark zuckerberg trying to 
trying no, to but Mark it. Zuckerberg in, invests a lot in, in research, you know, like they are doing like hardware research, they are doing AI research, they're adding like sensory stuff to it's I can understand if he's spending billions. Uh, nah, Mark Zuckerberg is just a digital gum tree. <laughs> I like I like him. He's so refreshingly weird. I mean, you need of these course, guys. He's, a, he's an AI. He's an AI. He's an AI, for God's sake. Him and you, Bezos and Elon are not like, real. I also like, you know, add, like, add, by the way, I never had like a Facebook account, etc. I also get on that bandwagon. But at this moment in time, I don't think there's anybody who has done more for the metaverse space than Mark Zuckerberg. That's the hands down reality of it. Well, he made um, VR cheap because um, Oculus, exactly. come on. I mean, I brought three of them for everyone. I'm like, you've got to have one. You've got to get I know, one. I got, I got all my friends them as well because yeah. it's it's dope. And like, we do not play enough VR ping pong, Swanee. Oh, we should play more. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saving Resident Evil. I'm, I'm at my brother's 8,000 square foot. Um, oh, that's right. You've got, a, you've got a limitless zone in which to do VR. That's the yes. best. I've got By developer way, mode so guys... I can just walk around. If you guys are a non-believer in VR, I would like you to check out this one experience. It's a bit difficult to get into, but try to look up for it. It's called Ghost Club. I'm hundred um, percent in. I love yeah, it. Yeah, we're, we're we're very much fans of VR. We love VR. Yeah, <laughs> I'm top. I'm yeah. top ten pistol whip. Come on, yeah, me too. in the world. It's a whip. No, no, no. You, you must uh, let us know where that is, and we will go and we will go and yeah. feast our eyes on it. Because yeah, we're we're big uh, VR proponents. Big sure. Time. All right, guys. Um, well, listen, Ahad, that was that was a real pleasure to talk to you. I'm hoping to get Jin on very, very soon because I know he's a huge contributor to your ecosystem and everything you're building, and he's a fascinating dude. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Swan, I'm also going to have to say goodbye to you as well before we bring Matty on because of the weird way we're doing this stream. No worries. So thanks, I've, I've just got to... I've just got to shout out to Baron Von Butzex in the oh, chat no, just for beautiful. having the name. I had. <laughs> so that was our stream for today. Coming up, we have Matty, the Decentraland blogger, the founder of MetaKey, who's building an open world that it's kind of like a layer two for the metaverse. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating conversation. And here it comes. Yeah, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> I don't quite know what's going on here. I need to just uh, try and figure out a different setup and see if I can uh, figure out what's going on here because it should work. <clears throat> it should work, but for some reason it doesn't. And I had it working before the stream started. This is live, everyone. This is what happens. So let's see if we can get Matty. Uh, let me just tweak a few things here <clears throat> and see what I can do. So where is Matty? There's Matty. Do we hear him? No. Do we hear me? No. Well, that fundamentally does not work. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, well, 
we will have to figure out another way to do this and maybe we have to do it as a as a pre-record or another kind of recording and that's a shame i like the animated version of me too um well that's a, that's a real shame i don't quite know why that happened uh i had it working just fine before the stream started uh no that's not it that should be it that is the clip and it's just not putting the audio where it's supposed to uh which sucks i don't know why let's see if i can get this to monitor out no no i think it's dead everyone i apologize but i think it's dead try turning it on and off again well i mean yes i would i have actually tried that and uh i cannot get it to work i cannot get it to work um there is it was actually working earlier and when these things happen sometimes you just have to wave the white flag and say you know what it wasn't meant to be uh come on one last go it's a simple audio monitoring audio routing issue and i fixed it a hundred times in the past and now we have nothing it's just not rooting it out no okay well in that case we will get ralph pal on the phone stat he'll fix it yeah i don't think he will you know he's very busy ralph uh well anyone have any questions for me i'll just jam and uh and improvise for the next 10 minutes and then i'll probably have to stop because <laughs> did, did i not pay the sound bills this month uh yeah it looks like i didn't oh this is so annoying normally i have a tech team but they're all on holiday today uh so they can't do anything which which kind of sucks um i'm not really sure what else i can do it is is game over the guest is facing it he's just pretending to talk yes you're absolutely right clash am i still involved with harmony no i am not still involved with harmony uh unfortunately uh thank you el gooch thank you this is the very first time we've had a snafu of this of this scope normally like the whole stream is just buggered uh, about five minutes before we set up and then at the very last minute we managed to get it all working and then we good but today it is it has definitely not happened today advanced audio properties and that should be it that should be it playing right now but it is not damn don't understand how that happened well there you go all right guys uh then i'm going to say goodbye and kill this for now because um i have other things to do it's been lovely having you on the stream and i will see you just vo over it i can't vo over it ha uh, i can't vo over it because I i've got other things to do my friends lovely to have you on the show join us uh, next week at the same time for more of the same fun and games and uh, i will figure out a way to get matty's video up online i'll probably just uh put it up as a as a video on its own tomorrow peace see y'all have a good one have a great weekend Yo, listen, I'm back. And you know what? I think I fixed it. Like an absolute boss, I think I might have fixed it. So bear with me. Bear with me. Let's see if we can get Matty to play now. So it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome one of the OGs of the metaverse space, Matty. As you probably know, Matty, DCL blogger. And there's so much to <clears> pack <throat> into here. But Matty, welcome. <laughs> How have you been, sir? It's been a busy 12 months for you. 
Yeah, good, man. Well, uh, pleasure to be on this. Um, I know your show is always uh, ahead of everyone else in terms of the visuals, at least. It's, it's looking really good. But um, yeah, man, it's been a busy 12 months. Uh, those have been, that have been following my work know that I've founded a project called Medici, which is pretty much exactly a year old. Um, had a kid and obviously Web3 space is just bonkers. So you're living, surviving, which is uh, what all of us are aiming to do at this stage, just to see this Web3 phase out. But uh, yeah, it's been exciting, just building stuff and um, enjoying the innovations in the space really. Well, you say surviving, but I think also thriving because you you took on the challenge that I think a lot of people who fall into the rabbit hole of this space, they go, well, I mm. like it here. Now I want to make something. I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to mm. actually create. And then they yeah. discover that it's actually really, really hard. And, and you're one of the people that, that took that journey and you've started mm. delivering stuff. And it's so impressive now to see the scope of what you've created. But I wonder Thanks. if you could take us, take us back to why you're called DCL Blogger. You were a Decentraland fan back in the day. Yeah. Decentraland is quite old now. It's like four years old. Yeah. What, old. what was the hook for you at that early stage of this metaverse adventure? Yeah, it was, uh, I remember Decentraland, I, I stumbled upon the project because I liked the logo on CoinMarketCap. It was seriously? kind of like, a, that, it was was it? Was like that. that was wow. it. That was it, was like a, it was um, a little island logo and it looked like a game. And I was like, oh, Decentraland looks like a game, something that's not as financial or corporate than everything else in crypto. And let's face it, you know, 2017, 2018, everything in crypto was super boring. Like, it were, you know, whatever, the yeah coins or currencies bitcoin competitors nano blockchain and all these things that yeah tech heavy but people like me from the gaming world um that like entertainment and stuff didn't really click too much but hey it was a money-making opportunity so we participated so yeah this was the central and logo it popped up and i was like oh what's this interesting thing clicked on it joined the discord watched the trailer video which at the time was saying that hey you could there's this virtual reality world that we're going to build and you can build whatever you want on these blocks of land. The blocks of land themselves are on blockchain. Back then, they didn't call them NFTs. They just called them virtual land or collectibles. NFTs is actually a very new uh, terminology for the whole space. It, it, it was never called that. I was thinking we'd go mainstream with crypto collectibles or something. But um, yeah, join the Discord. And what hooked me to it was my first investment into land. I negotiated my way in. There was this guy who was selling them for, I think, 3,000 or 4,000 mana land. And back then with Decentraland, there was no marketplace. There, nothing was, there was no place where you could buy and sell. And OpenSea didn't have Decentraland on it. OpenSea was, no one even knew what about OpenSea. So the only way to transact land at the time was actually to message someone on Discord, handshake, virtually handshake on a deal, send them the mana, and pray to God that they'll send the land back. That's how wow. deals were done. Yeah, so, that's so people, how they were done. people get mad about pseudo swap now because they're like, uh, "Do I trust this guy? Do I not trust this guy?" There was no open sea. There was no marketplace. Yeah. And also, if you remember, the Decentraland ICO was one of the scammiest things I ever saw. Mm. It was literally. I didn't participate in it. All I knew yeah. was it sold out in twenty seconds, and there were yeah, some whales. It, that just yeah, so some some whales just literally just cartelled the whole thing and took took over all of the land. It was it was nuts. And you're just thinking, mm. yeah. All of the kind of ideals of, the, of what this space, this massive sandbox could be, was broken at that point. And of course, that is a long time in the past. But then it, you stuck with it. So what, what was yeah. then the hook to stay with it and continue telling yeah. that story? So, so I was buying and selling land. So I was successfully negotiating land at a cheaper entry and buying portfolios of people and then selling them um, to those that wanted to enter the space and build stuff in Decentraland. And initially it was like, whoa, this is awesome. I can buy and sell a virtual land. I don't know what I'm doing, but you can buy and sell these digital assets, which some way, someday will be integrated. And I was very excited about what they were building. Um, the fact that you could deploy stuff on your land and you could there's this developer community that could create something and that thing could move between lands. It was kind of like a mini, they call it a metaverse. It was a mini metaverse sort of thing. And the prospect of that was quite interesting. Um, but I was in a bit of a bubble because all I, all I, all, my little world of NFTs was central land and virtual land. And what really kept me in, I think, started to shift in the 2019, 2020 mark, which was decentral land or these virtual land spaces started to become a hub for, okay, I'm an artist 
or I'm a collector, how do I showcase that visually? Okay, well, let's build a gallery in Decentraland and showcase my art. And suddenly there was this intersection of different NFT industries connecting in some way, shape or form. So that's when it sort of blew up for me and being like, oh, wait a second, this, I mean, I was blessed to be making some financial return during the two years of a, of a bear market. But on top of that, there was a, a larger contribution to be made across the space on what Decentraland or a, a similar virtual world could be. So that's when I started to really explore, okay, what, I'll, what I'll, what's the art world? What's the collectible world? What's the gaming world? Can these talk to each other? And um, yeah, that's that was 2020 to 2022 has been much of that journey. And then what was the catalyst for you to create the meta key? And maybe you could explain to our viewers what the meta key actually is. Yeah. So the cool thing about blockchain apps is they can sort of speak to each other. Um, everything's built on the same database. In this case, well, let's just take Ethereum, for example, where an app or a game that you build on Ethereum, uh, that database is shared. So if you issue an NFT to a game one, game two can read that NFT to say, well, in our game, that NFT could be a sword. Game three can say, well, in our game, that same NFT could be a pet. Um, and, and that's what uh, interested me in the space was this new layer of connectivity. So the MediKey was a project that I founded about a year ago. And the concept was, all right, let's sell these MediKey tokens, which are these VIP styled cards. I guess the closest thing you can compare it in the real world is a VIP card of some way or form. But, the, but in the digital world, every single person that has this MediKey um, we as the MediKey company will keep creating utility for what you can do with this MediKey. And so every seen, every, as we have seen in the NFT industry so far, you know, basic utility is whitelists or competitions and giveaways. They're really scratching the surface. But what if we could build a full blown out course database, which has hundreds of course, courses about Web3 created by the community and the entry or how you get access to that is with the MediKey. It opens up and you could go in there and what if we add a participate to earn layer on top of it where if you're a MediKey owner, you could create courses or you could learn things and get um, a token revenue. Um, what if we could do all sorts of things? So recently we launched, um, you know, we're working with Decentraland and the Sandbox where you can take the MediKey within their spaces and integrate it within many, many games and experiences. But recently we launched this project called New Ganymede um, and the concept of the MediKey was, all right, yes, you can get courses. What about, you know, you can use the MediKey to, um, at this point also, you can use the MediKey to set a um, an ad placement in some of our websites, right? CryptoArtPulse.com, you can actually put an ad banner at the top if you have a MediKey. We're also looking at ways to, in the virtual world, some of our, like our HQ and whatever we're building, we're going to put ad placements in the form of, not the traditional just banner ads and all that sort of stuff, but things like, you know, floating um, hot air balloons and stuff like that. And MediKey owners can put stuff on our virtual world on our sort of um, interface using a MediKey. So we're looking at how the MediKey can be used and playing with all the utility use cases in the space, integrated that all into that one MediKey. So a MediKey owner three to five years down the track can do hundreds of different things. Yeah, I, I kind of I liken it to like a, the, an Amex Black card in a way in that a way. if you yeah it, yeah. it, give, it grants you access and, and privileges and perks but it's also not crazy expensive to buy the most recent one i know you were scaling up there's like four generations of them artifact design mm -hmm. one um they're really sexy like animations yeah. as well they're, they're cool things to own what's mm. you know you've ideally people would have one of these things and it would give them access to experiences across the metaverse mm. but what is the metaverse for you? Mm -hmm. I think, and you know, I, I don't come from the background of reading books about the metaverse or doing much deep research. For me, I, I watched Ready Player One. I um, I remember playing or watching Sword Art Online, which is an anime. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it was this dude who puts his VR goggles on and suddenly he's in this virtual world and he's slaying monsters with his buddies and stuff like that. For me, um, the blockchain layer, what it adds to this is I mean, if we're just talking visual, the metaverse is any sort of digital experience that merges with the physical or any sort of multi-layered visual experience that you have, whether you're on Twitter at the same time and then you're all tapping into a game and you're communicating with people there. I think blockchain adds the ability for this metaverse concept to also take your assets, your digital assets across these separate apps. 
So I think blockchain, for, in my opinion, the metaverse is kind of like this interconnectivity of your assets and your experiences across different spaces where you seamlessly put on your VR, gla VR glasses and go hang out with friends, hundreds of them, and go to experiences across the virtual globe. Uh, and you take it off and you're in the real world as well. But the blockchain layer adds this thing where you can take your NFTs and your, your crypto token and suddenly you're the millions of dollars or the tens of thousands of dollars that you have uh, from your digital assets that that pet that you had in game one, you can take it to Decentraland in a meetup and, and that pet will be following you around there as well. So for me, the metaverse is just the connectivity layer, the experience layer. Um, and I think there should be frictionless um, transitions in between both of them. It's really, really interesting that the the concept that we have in our brains is very much a Web2 concept, which is we have these, I guess, what you would associate with skyscrapers of of functionality, which is like your Facebook is a massive skyscraper. You go in that building and you never need to leave. Everything happens in there. And yet the world mm -hmm. is much larger than that. And, and what you're talking about is composability and interoperability, obviously. Any game yeah. designer will say, well, that's just a joke. You cannot possibly do that. And I think for legacy games, with their legacy yeah. systems, that's probably true. But for the next generation of games that are built with this in mind from the ground up, as you say, yeah. the metadata that powers your NFT mm. is the thing that matters less than the visual execution in one particular instance Absolutely. of it. Is that, is that kind of how you see it? I do. Yeah, the metadata is sort of like your building blocks and whether you choose to integrate that within your game in whichever way you want. And I think legacy game developers have a an issue understanding why would a project monetize like what's the financial benefit or the user base benefit of a project saying all right well i'll integrate your nfts and i'll remodel this whole rig this this whole skin of all your assets within hours even though they're, they're different you know between games is different sizes and different functionalities of what a character can do in 3d in one game and in, and in another game it all has to have to be composable they all have to be the same and there has to be a standard that everyone sort of agrees to so when they make their assets we can just pull them from one place and throw them into our game and it's done so i think the business models are very different in web3 you're monetized by your token value as a project um, the more you collaborate the stronger your value proposition your legacy building rather than user base building at the moment like people are trying to stamp their mark as to who they are in the space rather than onboard millions of people um, the millions of people that are the user base they're not even here yet it's mostly the investor and the cur the curious base. That's the people that uh, we're dealing with at the moment. So when legacy gamers look at this space or the devs, they just it doesn't make any sense to them. And you can understand why. But the larger studios, whether it be Ubisoft or Square Enix, they've all put PR notes out saying that they're super interested in exper experimenting with what blockchain has to offer games. They see the um, benefit. And although they may not work on interoperability between Square Enix or um, and Ubisoft or, or connect those ecosystems, but within their own ecosystem, I can totally see them saying, well, you, you got an item in Final Fantasy 2, it's going to be able to be used in Final Fantasy 3, 4, 5, and 6, and this new game that we do and this, this other genre that we do and this collaboration that we do with this other game, I can see them going that way. So um, I think, um, yeah, it's, it is, and I've also had a recent conversation with some of like my team from the Medici, which was saying, Maddie, you know, like it's it's a very, there's a lot of people in the West, a lot of the gaming world in the West don't like the concept of NFTs, but the Asian market, whether it be South Korea or whether it be Japan, like these guys are very embracing of new tech and what that can do. And they're really the powerhouses of innovation when it comes to gaming and, and virtual experiences. And they're not even online yet um, with their strategies. So I think we're going to see a massive surge just come out of nowhere. Yeah, it was a it was a strange experience for me because I, I did a film all about why gamers hate NFTs, and so I, I spent time and I tried to understand their point of view. And if you think about the kind of the last 10, 15 years of game development, and particularly AAA games, and how they extract money from mm -hmm. gamers mm -hmm. through lots of different, fairly snide mechanisms, this is mm -hmm. where they're coming from, and this is why they're pissed off. And I and they see yeah. NFTs as another version of that, and then they see these board apes, and they don't get it. And it, we mm. make so much noise. We're so rowdy and so rough around the edges, let's be honest, that it, mm. that it really pisses them off. So for them, the strongest position, particularly when you think about the influencers and the YouTubers and everything else, the strongest position for them to take is one of opposition. 
Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right. It seems inevitable to me that the, the value of an item, the value of time spent playing a game, all of this should be returned back in some way to an owner. And I spoke to a, you know, a small game publisher and he said, you know, I, our kids are going to look back in 20 years and say, you, what, what the fuck were you guys doing? You're being had. You're being had mm-hmm. by these companies. <clears throat> and so when I see the meta key and I see New Ganymede, what I'm particularly interested in is... Mm-hmm. You are you're you're setting up store in in a way that I don't see other metaverse players doing. So like there's the the Facebook version of this, and then we've just seen the other side and the Yuga Labs version of this with this massive VC war chest. What is New Ganymede doing differently, and how do you fit into this broader idea of what we think the metaverse actually is? Mm. I think one thing that we wanted to be clear with with the medic, the uh, new Ganymede, which is a virtual world that we're building, <clears throat> was what is its, how does it participate as a verse in this whole metaverse thing or a virtual world, right? And are we competitors? Are we competitors to Decentraland and the sandbox? Or are we supplementary to the experiences that you would have in the sandbox, et cetera? All we want to do is contribute to two major ideas. And that's the interoperability factor where you get an item in Decentraland and in the sandbox or any other virtual world that comes out there and you can use it in New Ganymede. Now, if that leads to standards that people and projects start to agree on and then suddenly that accelerates their interoperability, then that's it. I think we fulfilled our role. So we're, we're, we're trying to showcase what interoperability could look like um, at a really cool, high quality 3D level of games that are, are unique and what our team have said is, they said, Maddie, let's just build our hub for the next eight to 10 months. It's going to look epic. But then once we've done all the 3D assets and we're very clear on the quest that we want to do, we can start to build out these games every three to four months and do this metaverse-wide quests where you can go to Decentraland and go to an event there, go to the sandbox and play a game over there. They come back to New Ganymede and do a quest within New Ganymede, all within a storyline. Get an item which you can use across all spaces at the same time, the same item, not three different NFTs, but one NFT. So we want to experiment with that, um, the interoperability layer with quests that are that, that span and connect with multiple projects. But we also want to experiment with the, um, the the experience layer, right? When people go to this, like when you go to Decentraland, it's a great place. They've done a great job in terms of the structural component and the decentralization of the platform. On the experience layer, there's not much that people do there when it comes to going there. Do they play games? Do they go to events? Um, and the average user retention isn't that long. They've got a lot to work out. And I'm sure they will. Um, the sandbox isn't even out yet. Um, what if we were to build some really high quality games, run some esports events metaverse wide that are very familiar, like shooting games and car racing games and all sorts of games, like glider races, right? What if you can go in there with your avatar, whether you're a Cybercom or a Clonex or a Board Ape? And there's, there's many, many mid to large tier projects that are really looking for something to do with their avatars. What if we build them all in? They can bring hundreds, if not thousands, of people within the same instance, which um, we're talking to some some really high high um, large scaling tech solutions for that, and and participating games and quests that utilize the assets and the projects within the space instead of recreating our own metaverse and saying, all right, well we're selling land in our metaverse, you can create in our metaverse, come bring into ours. Why not utilize everyone that's out there and do like this metaverse wide events and experiences? So experiences are one thing, and interoperability are, are other things. We don't want to just say, well, you know, we're going to be the leaders and we're going to show everything how it's going to be done. I know that this whole metaverse concept will just be contributions, small, small contributions by many, many players. And we just want to participate and contribute to the idea of what, when someone says, well, what the hell can you do with this JPEG? Well, we want to be able to say, well, this is what people are doing with the JPEG and it's freaking cool. And you can relate to that because you're a gamer. Yeah, I had an I had an idea. Just, I think the middle of last year, I was like, Board Ape Racing Drivers Club. We even went as far as putting a Discord together. We started styling up board apes as like, you know, 1960s, 70s races. We were going to try and build a Mario Kart racing game and then allow other projects to race because we thought it would be pretty simple to integrate like mm. other other projects into this thing. And then we mm. had this concept of pink slip so you could bet your your ape or your duck or your, your cool cat <laughs> on the outcome of a race, all these kind of things. And then we realized building games is really hard. <laughs> 
Like it's really hard. You go, yeah, we can just buy one off the shelf, but then, okay, yeah, then skinning it up and actually make it run the networking for multiple player integrations and then token integration. And then we stopped. Like, this is <laughs> never going to happen. So you're taking this on and like, I mean, dude, how, how, how are you doing this? I mean, and but also, I'm curious, what, what platform are you building on? Is it Unity? Is it Unreal? Like, how, how's it's it unreal. happening? It's Unreal. Yeah, it's Unreal uh, for now. And so I'll tell you how the concept of Neganimi came about. Um, as you know, the Medici, we look for different ways to build out our offerings and what we're actually going to be doing in the space. We came out with, all right, we're doing four major things in the space. We're bringing on brands that are legacy brands that want to connect to an NFT native crowd. We're working in, in, a, in a, a bridge that has them coming into the space and have, has them delivering value to Medici owners and therefore they connect to the space, Medici owners get something that's aligned. Um, then we had the education layer, which was the Medicademy thing, which was we were going to pump up with courses and you can use your Medici to get courses. Um, and then one of the, th the third thing that came about, which is what the team pitched to me. So we hired a pretty decent art team to start building events in Decentraland and the Sandbox. And, you know, we have a pretty large land treasury. We're like, all right, let's just build some large scale events and blow up the space. The cool thing was that the art director that we hired, Billy, comes from a, a background of just building games as a hobby and managing an art team of like 10 to 15 people uh, and direct, directing that and working with games, et cetera. Michael comes from a game story background and he's worked with Square Enix and he's a Twitch streamer, he's a YouTube streamer and he loves the story writing, building and community management. He's really good at that stuff. So the team that we ended up hiring, they were all into this concept. They're like, Maddie, we actually have the resources there's a 15 of us all in the art team. Let's just dedicate, why don't we build our own experiences? And they showed us what, they showed me and my co-founder Mossy or what they could build. And I was like, this makes a lot of sense. You know, it's needed. It builds a lot of utility and value to the Medici. It allows us to do whatever we want to do. And that's how we're building it. Like they came up with the concept and we're blessed to have a team like that. And like, Maddie, we can build this, trust, trust me. So it took two to three months to show what they could build. And I was like, this is super impressive. Let's run with it. Let's go and build it out. And uh, yeah, you're right. It is difficult to, to build it out. But if you have the, the people that kind of can zoom out and build a process to it all and can focus on building it out on a strategic, like a, a process-based basis, then I think it makes sense. Um, so yeah, it, it's not that expensive as you would think, but it is time consuming. And although this is a trailer, the final output would probably be eight months to a year from now. And it's going to look a hundred times better than what we showed. But uh, yeah, there's 15 people working on it at the moment. We'll probably double it to another, another 10 to 15 to build um, the, the whole project out. But um, yeah, that's how we're sort of building it out. So uh, I'm, I remember reading the, the Medium article when it launched. And you launched pretty much the same time as the other side launched. So the metaverse buzz was in the air. You call mm -hmm. it a bustling, hate of, a bustling hub of trade, travel, entertainment, and culture built upon a vestiversal bridge in the early 2020s. Now, several decades later, it's become a bastion for decentralized humanity living on the blockchain, besieged and blockaded by an interstellar corporate monopoly, Solar. Here we find the home of the disruptive meta key holders, the swashbuckling motor crew, and many of their allies and rivals. Bit of a story going on there. And like, it's kind of, Similar to what cyber brokers have done, actually taking the idea of um, mm. you know disconnected uh, sentient humanity in this virtual world and and mm. giving it a, a narrative and some law. But what I, I thought was really interesting was you said there's only one there is a, there is only one metaverse. The interconnection of all physical, digital, and virtual spaces, defined by interoperability, grows in the spaces between these signers and along the bridges which break through them. You're the only person I've seen talking about this about piping about connectivity everyone else is talking about hey look how amazing our world looks but actually mm -hmm. what you're talking about is you've built europe that's the face that's effectively what it is if you're a european citizen you have a european passport you can go anywhere in europe mm. it's 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 kind of crazy for other people to understand that but like as a mm. british citizen we left europe and suddenly that was taken away from me like this this ability to just travel anywhere be anywhere use a kind of common currency it's very it feels very european to me it's kind of strange yeah yeah um we're looking at the space as to not again it's it's not like a, a thing where we build and we want everyone in our world we're looking at the space as what's the tech that's built what's the projects that are built and how to utilize them in the one experience so 
you're right. It is, we're looking at this whole metaverse concept of just a con contribution to the metaverse as to building the metaverse. I think this project is coming out and saying, welcome to our metaverse or welcome to the metaverse. And I think it's a very naive concept. I think when thousands of projects come to this space, everyone's going to look so minuscule uh, compared to a handful that will probably be the giants. But I can see like a very big developer community. You, you know how Roblox works, right? Yeah. There's smaller games across a larger platform. The, get, the items that you win in, in any game, you, could, you, you sort of use it in different Roblox games. It's sort of like that, but a large scale thing. So we're just like one experience layer. Um, and we're going to be like, you know how you mentioned it's, it was difficult to build a car racing game. What if we built out those experiences and games and, and all of those things that are pretty high level where you could play them, participate in them. You could run esports levels in them and we made it kind of easy for you to bring in your avatars. You could, so other projects could connect in different ways. And within that world, you know, if we could connect to a finance layer that allows you to take NFT loans, we'll do it. If we could connect to, um, you could just bring your avatar in and just play as that and we'll have. We can manage, and I think what we will do is when we release our token, if we will do it much later on, we'll have like a treasury that will 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 um, kind of foster and contribute and encourage people to make quests as opposed to um, you know more product. It's more questing. It's more experiences. I really think the experience layer is just non-existent in the NFT space. Like you come here, the really, or the only thing you do is buy and sell and, and sort of make money. Yeah, there's, and you, and you Discord, Discord is the experience layer, isn't it? And like it, it, the entertainment is in, is the floor price. That's your source yeah. of entertainment, which is, which is nuts to me. So gaming is obviously mm. one, one level of experience. Some, something we've been looking at as well is the metaverse needs a, a TV channel. It needs yeah. its own broadcasting network. And yeah. like, what does that look like in hand? And how would you distribute it to people? And how would you allow them to connect to this broader story and understand what's going on and cut through the noise? Because it is so noisy out there. And it's getting mm. noisier and noisier and noisier because so many journalists are piling in and they don't get it, uh, mm. which is fine because they, they will eventually. But I think it's, what's interesting about what you're doing is it feels much more like an expansion pack or a layer two for mm. the bigger, broader metaverse stuff that's going on. And I think that means you can be more agile, but probably more focused on, doing the things that matter most, which like you say, is the, um, the interoperability. There's another project I was checking out called Webiverse, where it's very much an open source community. And they, they sort of grew out of the loot thing. So they took all the loot metadata and they said, well, what if we took a, a game world or a VR developer world approach to this rather than mm -hmm. NFTs, we make 3D assets that can then be put into a virtual world and we get mm -hmm. Blender artists and everything else. It's really interesting what's coming out of it. Um, the Webiverse is very good. Yeah, it's cool, right? I know that because Jin's behind it. And Jin's, Jin. um, yeah. I know that guy lives and breeds the whole interoperability concept more than me at a, at a deeper level than anyone that I have met. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think he really gets it. The, the different approach that we're taking to Webiverse, I think, and I haven't really investigated Webiverse that much, and I should. Uh, well, they're going to be they're going to be on the same show as this, believe it or not. Oh, so go. they're they're going to be yeah. after you. <laughs> so we'll oh, we'll, hear. You we'll tell Jin I said hi. Um, I, I've talked to him here and there quite a lot. He used to be a very early participator and also a critique of Decentraland for the right reasons. But um, I think what they believe in is agreeing to a standard and utilizing and open sourcing everything so that everyone can sort of work towards the metaverse, and that is the right way to go about it. I think that there's a lot of untapped um, potential that Unreal and other engines have. Uh, Unreal specifically because I know um, a project that is working on a Web3 layer for Unreal where we can just plug into and suddenly allows us to connect and integrate NFTs at a, at a pretty efficient layer. Crucible. Efficient level. Crucible. Yeah, yep. Crucible. Ryan, I know pretty well. And yeah. He pitched the idea yeah. to me a year and a half ago. So Crucible and there's, there's developer communities across everywhere. So not just web, but within these these siloed ecosystems or these very um you know closed ecosystem, which you may call Unreal or you may call Steam, etc. But I think these will start to open up, and I think Steam developers will start to connect with Unreal developers. Unreal developers will start to connect to the web, and I think there will be a lot of this stuff. And I think an experience layer where you can go and have high quality shooting game experiences, etc., where it works really well. It's it, it, there's no lag, um, all that sort of stuff. I think 
that will accelerate or contribute in one way. I think the open source and everyone, let's all the developer community work on this and figure this out, which is Jin's approach, that will actually work in some way, but they all sort of need really accelerated pushes to make happen. And again, I just see ourselves as contributing to where this metaverse thing will be in the next 10, 15 years. There's going to be um, a landmark moment at some point. There's going to be a thing where you, you it suddenly just happens and we're all kind of maneuvering and trying to figure out what that is and but I think hopefully having fun, because I think that's the thing that people forget. This is actually really yeah. fun. And I, I have I have so much more fun in this space and in this environment than I mm. ever did in shitcoins and altcoins. Because I, like you, I got into this in 2017 and I was trading tokens with teams you never met, you never knew anything about them. But this, this is, this is, this has got something and it's got this story component to it. And like you mentioned Roblox, literally this morning when I got up, the first thing the kids came in is, please daddy, can we just spend five minutes playing Roblox? And it's not because they want to play the game. They want to play the game at the same time on their own phones, but mm. with each other. And the Roblox mm. games are terrible. Let's be honest, most of them, but they don't care. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's the, you know, that's exactly it. And I, I, this blew my tiny little mind, like these tiny humans who are going to be, you know, taking over the world in the next three, four years. That's that's their world. That's their universe. But what mm. we're building is the is is the next stage for them of that. And it's. I wonder if they're just going to come to the space and then just take a big rubber out and just rub everything that we've done out and just build their own experiences. Because <laughs> I feel like the younger generation get and want things that we're predicting they want, but they they just think and act completely different. Dude, they're in their I'm, own world. I'm like a broken record on this, but like it, every day I just watch what they do. And it's like, I'll tell you what it is. My phone battery has never been so broken in its entire existence. Like my phone just drains a battery because they're just playing Roblox the whole time. I'm like, dude, kids, wh what is this? Like whoever hmm. solves battery tech is going to, is going to rule <laughs> the universe. But like, it, it's absolutely right. If hmm. you, if you haven't had the experience of growing up with, like cassette tapes and mini discs and compact discs and not mm. being able to access all the music that's ever been made ever. <clears throat> what, 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 what do you think about what gets in the way? What problems are you looking to solve? And it, for me, it's all social. It's just yeah. connecting with other human beings and being mm. with your mates. And that, yeah. that, that really is, you know, when you're talking about the networking problem, it, for me, it's that um, better social yeah. experiences or different social experiences that we're going to drive kids to, to congregate around an experience. So, um, yeah, and I have no idea. I think, that, yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that's you're right. It's a social experience. It's kind of like why do people go to a restaurant, um, even if it's the best looking restaurant in the world, but there's only three people in it. The vibe hits different when you go to a terrible looking restaurant, but there's a thousand people in it. You're like, well, this place is buzzing. You feel different. You act different. You have the food. It might be terrible, but you have a great time because you're there with your friends, and there's another hundred people around you. P human beings just have a thing where when there's people there, they just feel good. So I think that you're right when, you know, PVP became a big deal when suddenly people could verse each other in gameplay apart from just going in solo quests. It just changed everything right on the internet. Yeah. So the more we can write, run and build experiences where hundreds, if not thousands of people can connect in different ways, the, the more cooler shit we'll build. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting look, looking through the other side and the connection with Improbable and the M squared universes and interoperable metaverses, you can see where they're going with it. It's just like, it's an empty landscape. It's an empty wilderness. I, I, did you ever spend much time in Somnium? I uh, have not, I've gone in a, in a 2D space. I don't have a VR. I know Artur, um, he's evangelical when it comes to VR and, and the NFT space, but they're doing some cool stuff. They are, I, every time I go into Somnium, you just look around and go, holy shit, this really is the metaverse. It feels immersive. NFTs look incredible mm. in there. It's empty. Mm. And it's like yeah. the, the, the VR goggles are such a barrier to what is, to me, like yeah. a really fantastic, and you, you can jump in a car and drive around there. It makes you totally sick. But like, it, it really is like the closest I've seen to a version of the metaverse. And it, you know, mm. I, want, I wanted to create films in there, but it's just a little bit clunky at the moment. So we kind of step yeah. back from it, but it's still, you know, as you said, like the getting people to congregate together you know, like the Travis Scott Fortnite concert, you know, that is, yeah. that is people who were there and were part of that just said it was mind blowing. Yeah. So yeah. we know it's possible. Yeah. I think it was mind blowing because you were there with all your friends. And what interested me a lot was 
it wasn't even in VR, right? No. It was it was a non-VR event. And we're all here thinking that VR, well, there was a phase where we thought VR was integral to get people here. And then this Travis concert um, happened. And then suddenly people, they love just these experiences. They're not in VR, but they're with their friends on the phone at the same time. They're like, oh, dude, come over here, check this out. It was just a fun experience. So, yeah, it really um, was. It was, like, it was like being at a festival. And particularly given hmm. the state of the world at the time, it felt like a really interesting way of expressing who you are mm. and the com- commun- you know communing with other people and it wouldn't um didn't Fortnite hold any more concerts like that surely they did yeah that. ariana grande was was the next one um was it a big deal i, I didn't hear about yeah, it yeah it was it was a big deal i mean the travis scott one was just so visually arresting but yeah i mean uh, uh, there's the i play probably planning more it was such a huge success um but i, I think so i guess like the Fortnite, if they had done that sorry to cut you off all the no, time no, 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 go ahead. But, so imagine if um, <clears throat> they did that, they dropped everyone NFTs for free, or you could go claim them and get certain things. And suddenly four years later, you see someone wearing a Travis Scott shirt and you're like, oh, he was at the concert. Um, and same thing. I think that is the future. I think like just running large scale events, people seamlessly getting NFTs that represent different timelines of progress within the space, a different art, different parts of the culture in, in different ways. I think that's the future rather than buying your way into large communities yeah so, it could be you know like the one of the growth areas i i <clears throat> kind of see is digital fashion and you know sneakers artifacts and crypto kicks and that kind of thing i'm curious do you get approached by brands to link up with your meta key community a lot yeah heaps the, the problem is that brands they want to activate in this space the the problem we have is how do we collaborate with them where it's more of a value share than a value extract you know because most of them come with an nft sales strategy less of them come with an activation legacy building strategy as to hey let's build an experience and build something epic so that we stamp our name here it's more like let's sell 10 million dollars worth of stuff in this space and then talk about it to our investors so we're very we we got a lot of we had quite a few in the works really big names and we were pretty excited about that but we paused nine out of ten of them because it was like all right well if we just keep doing this stuff, then Medicare, at the end of all these experiences, Medicare is just going to be seen as like this thing that just pumps up something and sells on behalf of Web2 brand. And if they don't, if they, if they don't treat this as like a full transition into the Web3 space, then it's just going to be forgotten. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting for me because watching luxury brands maneuver into this space has been particularly interesting because luxury brands <clears throat> traditionally don't work very well digitally because you have the, this idea of craftsmanship and everything else. But once you have this idea of you know like desirability through digital assets luxury brands are like well hello finally you know we can step aside this ease of reproduction everything else to come in <laughs> nike i think are doing a really in- interesting job adidas are doing a really interesting job puma mm-hmm. are now stepped in so we're starting to see these recognizable high street brands with some street cred mm-hmm. jump into this space and i think it's just going to accelerate from here uh, yeah, I think those that are rooted in culture rather than kind of uh, prestige, I think they're going to have a demographic large enough to care. I think high-end people that are luxury focused, I'm not sure if that's a big enough user base to to um, you know appeal to rather than something like Nike or um, you know Adidas, where suddenly there's thousands of people that really love the brand that come in and they get something in the space. Yeah, that that notion of culture though, that is. I think at the the heart of why people struggle with board days because what they what they see is something which is cultureless, and mm. they they don't see the culture that is formed underneath it. It is specific and weird to this space. Mm. So you have this yeah. this this juxtaposition of existing cultures, mm. like hip hop or, or street culture or, or all these different mm. things, and then you have this board ape culture, which is a kind of catch-all for degens and yeah. and all this kind of stuff and they, and they have no idea that there was this DeFi summer that created mm. the ape meme that created bored apes they have no idea yeah. about that but yeah, like yeah. Wh- how are you supposed to tell them that yeah there was this period for about four months where you could just farm mm. shit and like we all did it and we were all stupid but somehow <laughs> we came out of our head and then and then we we celebrated it with these pictures like yeah yeah, what yeah. Do you, you yeah know, what do you, I, I do yeah, do you? You do. Yeah, well, do. You sound embarrassed by it. 
I am a little <laughs> bit embarrassed. I mean, you know, it's a little bit cringe. I, I had seven of them and I gave six of them away. Fuck, that's I gave awesome. six of them. I, I literally gave them to people for free because I wanted them to be part of this journey. Um, hey, that's awesome, man. That's and, awesome. Uh, and, all, and all of them, no, they didn't. All of them, but one sold around 15 each. <laughs> well, there you go. You yeah, I know. Them. I know. It's, but um, um, I, I actually never bought one. So the, the board ape launched at the same time Medicare launched. And I, I remember just being heads down building the Medicare and learning about this ape stuff and being like, shit, this is not blowing up, but I just don't have, don't have any time to do anything right now. But um, I, I still till today don't have one. And everyone keeps being like, Maddie, why don't you have a board ape? Maddie, you should get a board ape. And every time I've looked at it, I'm like, I'm not paying 30 ETH. I'm not paying 60 ETH. I'm not paying 100 ETH. And now it's, it's a joke. Or whatever. It's a but joke. Yeah. That being said, three days ago, a friend of mine somehow through luck uh, got KYC'd on the platform to participate in the NFT set, right? And I say by luck because he um, he KYC for a different project or a different token he was buying on the platform. And so by default, he was KYC to participate in the board Ape sale. So he was like, guys, I'm in. And we we're like, oh shit, you're in? And he only had enough money to get the first wave, which is the first like two, two lands. And me and my friends were like, all right, Maui, well, if you can only get the two first lands, why don't we get the next four? And we split it five ways among all of us. And we were all on the phone and we were all like excited about it. And I didn't have an ape at the time, but those moments, they reminded me of the, the core of that culture. It's like, this is what a board ape represents, right? Being on the phone, trying to figure it out. It's hype. The gas wars are going nuts. Do you get buy one? Do you not buy one? Um, and that excitement in the air was, I think that's the culture of what Bored Ape sort of represents is, is um, the madness in this it, space. And it, it's, it, all, it's all it, enabled by someone sitting on laptop clicking buttons. It, it is. <laughs> it's, it's, com now. it's completely nuts. And like you, you, you take a moment to step back and you go, did I really just spend $10,000 on gas? And you go, yes, I did. And then you go, how am I going to explain that to my wife? <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. We got the land. It's fine. Well, so well, I, we didn't oh, get the land. Oh, you didn't get the land. Oh, shit. shit. Oh, no, we didn't get the land. But the good thing is his gas didn't get, didn't, he didn't, he didn't lose a couple of ETH in gas. So no one got okay. that. He didn't even get his two. We didn't get oh, our four. It Jesus. was a funny experience. It and was... uh, you're right. Sometimes you look back and, you know, we're coming out of it and we're like, shit, you know, people have lost tens of thousands of dollars on this, this sale. And they were not even in the NFT space, and I wonder how they feel. But they but didn't. didn't yeah, it, they, they they refunded the gas. But like the people who spent the, the people who spent the gas, that was the cost of getting in. And like yeah. going back to 2017, gas wars for ICOs. I mean, I don't even remember that. Like I was buying ICOs out the wazoo, and like it was just part of the game, man. You just pushed gas, yeah. and you got it, and then you flipped, and then you moved on. Like it was, it was. It was brutal. So, do you, do you have a hot take on the other side? I mean, you must have been kind of going over some of the the details and what they're trying to build there. What do you um, think of it? All? I'm familiar with Improbable. Yeah. I am um, Improbable because my fund invested in in the tech uh, six months ago. They're very capable. And uh, when I learned that Improbable and Board Ape will be working together, I know that I was sort of hesitant about what they're going to be building. But if they're going to be working with Improbable, which have a decade long history of building the tech layer for this stuff, it's I'm sure it's going to look pretty epic. Um, yeah, I think the thing about Board Ape is they sort of know exactly what people want in the space and they know exactly how to deliver it. So that's why you get something like Board Ape. They're obviously one of the first to really blow up the space and hit, hit the exact culturally relevant project at the right time. But I think they're just um, a team that keeps being relevant every one or two months. They're like the biggest talk of the month, right? Which is very hard to do in the NFT space. So I don't have any doubt that they would deliver now. They're like half a billion dollars stocked up in capital. Um, I'm sure the other side is going to look epic. And if it doesn't look epic in the first day, it's going to look epic six months down the line. And if it doesn't look epic six months after release, it's going to look epic a year later. That's yeah, I think a lot of people, I, th I think a lot of people looked at it and went, 100,000 pieces of land. And then it's going to be 200,000 pieces of land. And they go, that is way too much. I'm sure mm -hmm. you're looking at it in the other, other direction, which is actually, it's probably not enough. How do you view it? It is a lot of land, but Sandbox is, I think, 160 or 180,000. Uh, Decentraland is 150 by 150, whatever that is. No, 300 by 390,000. So there is a lot of land. And um, 
I don't know, man. This land thing is great for investors, but for creators and people that actually want to play the game, it's a big prohibitor. So I haven't really figured out whether land is a net positive for the ecosystem or a net negative because it like kind of gates creativity. Well, I think so that's... So I want to see if we're able to figure it out. That was the bit that stood out for me in, the, in everything I read about it was that your, your piece of land can be farmed and it can actually be upgraded. And, and it's something you can build upon within the con you know you don't have to like in um decentraland or in mm. somnium just design a concept there are, there are resources built into the land and then you can swap yeah. and trade so you you're, you're good to go from the get go and also like there's going to be so much to discover through the rpg that if you're a passive investor it's probably not going to be great for you but if you're an active participant and you actually work the land literally mm. then it could end up being great for you even if you have a crappy piece of land somewhere the, the idea is that you build associations, you build connections with mm. those next to you, and then you derive value based on your collective participation in that. I think that's the kind of the, the, the idea. And yeah. you'll form guilds and everything else. But like, it's so early. It's very difficult to see that. I think that. it's super hard to work out. Yeah. I think it's like, there's so many moving parts to that. When there's financials involved, when there's an experience involved where you just want to have fun, that's different. You can there's there's fun mechanics you can build into that, but when there's money involved and when people are there right now, which I would assume the more the 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 people that currently have land, the majority of them are investors. Where when gameplay comes out, eighty five percent of them probably won't do anything with their land apart from hold it and maybe let someone else use it. I think that's what the issue that you have, not just in board eight land, but decentral land and the sandbox is where. Um, the experience, like the land and that tool, that asset that you need to actually build experiences in the world and participate and have fun is owned by a larger investor base rather than the um, experience base, user base. So uh, look, I, I'm interested to see how they figure it out. Um, uh, yeah, they've, they've added this dimension of this uh, new thing with coders and there's minerals that you can farm. So that I think they have enough flexibility in trying to figure it out. So yeah. So listen, Let's bring it back to New Ganymede. <clears throat> how can people get involved with New Ganymede? How can they? How can they be part of your journey and your story? Yeah, I mean, uh, right now we're building. We're sharing what we're building. We have a lot of hopes and people, uh, other avatar projects in the works where we will work with them um, and add them to our questing system and and all that sort of stuff. I think right now, you know, be part of the conversation in our Discord or on, on our Twitter. And when we start to build out the ecosystem, whether it be um, gliders or whether it be pets or whether it be avatars, you know, give us feedback or participate in what you think is, is good and cool. But, um, yeah, I think it's one of those things where you, you sort of just be part of the journey. And once we're ready to launch a year later, uh, be part of the actual experience layer. Absolutely. <clears throat> so one, one last thing I wanted to dig into was this idea of metaverse fast travel and how, cause I'm just reading through the, the blog, the blog again, and you're talking about projects airdropping a new version of a PFP as a separate NFT to existing holders. So like, like CyberKongs and then you have CyberKongs VX. You want to do away with that so that the, the asset always is the asset that you travel with. How, how do you see that? Yeah, so the avatars that we build are MetaCrew avatars. Like we're talking with DCL like specific, like officially and sandbox, like we're knocking on the doors, we're talking to Sebastian, we're saying, all right, well, how can we build these within your world where you take our avatar and you go there and you can use it in a voxelized version? So the only thing that needs to be done there is the modeling and the um, 3D asset work. And on their end, the coding to accept those avatars in their gameplay. So I think places like the sandbox, specifically, let's, let's, take about, let's talk about the sandbox because I think like a lot of their strategy would have been to build the economy this metaverse economy homegrown within the sandbox, you know, you build your avatars there, you build your pets there, and then you could sort of sell it and then generate a lot, of a lot of revenue that way. But the reality is unless they open up and allow other people to bring in their space, they're going to become irre irrelevant because another project will allow you to do that. So um, the way we're doing it is yes, we're just basically rebuilding our whole avatar set in 2D, 3D, voxelized, non-voxelized, whichever is needed for you to be able to take it in any way, shape or form in a different place. Sounds <clears throat> like a lot of work. Seriously. It is, it is, it is a lot of work, but um, ready to do it, man. Um, we're more interested in just to showcase, 
you know, I was kind of annoyed when I put out tweets about interoperability and they'd go viral all for the wrong reasons. They go, they get like 7,000 likes and, and retweets about, and how, you know, people that are in the gaming world be like, this is impossible. Why would people interop or, or collaborate? Or how can you do this when the assets need so much work to, to be in a different project or it's impossible to do so. So part of me also wants to prove that wrong. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> want to showcase what can be done and whether it be a small handful of people at this point or a small handful of projects doing it, I want to show that it can be done. Um, well, yeah. the way I see it, the, what's going to happen here is the, the success of this is going to be personality driven. So at the moment, we're, we're kind of idolizing developers and platforms, uh, but actually what's going to happen is somebody is going to be like a personality that takes this on and becomes a superhero character mm. across I multiple verses in games everything else and then other people cluster to that because they see that success i think that's my instinct is that's what's going to happen there's going to be kind of a lead out personality celebrity born mm. out of this space that becomes the thing that then brings in all the other people to it just 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 an instinct that i have because i think you need that you need to invest in a human and their story and follow along and then try and copy them and see how they did it and then beat them obviously um so until we have that that kind of lead human uh, in, in the story yeah. we, we, we're still going to be sort of building the, the the groundwork for them to come and mm. be that 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 early yeah. early superhero on anyway that that's yeah. that's just kind of my my thinking yeah, man the, there's no idea that's out of the bounds i mean three years ago if you asked me what, what would have been the catalyst that took main you know this space mainstream i don't think i would have said avatars i don't think i would have said board Ape. no one would have said that right no even I got, I, got, can have a I got really excited about nfts in 2018 i saw i saw the tech and i was like as a, as a filmmaker what i saw was the possibility to bust the privacy question wide open and generate a, a different kind of connection between an owner and um and a producer and that's yeah. sort of where we've got to but i never i never saw it in any way being like this, where communities are so frothy around mm. just this this idea of floor prices. I mean, I never saw that before. Mm. So yeah. you know, I, I'm unlike you. I'm excited, slightly concerned about where we are, but also like <laughs> you need this in order for some genius to come along and, and innovate here rather than wherever else they could mm. be. So um, yeah. you know, the milkshake brings the boys to the yard, and then they make a big mess. Or something. I don't know. But yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it's, it is interesting what's going on. I, I used to think, oh, can this whole, can the economic uh, conversations and you know, this culture of flaws and all that stuff, can that be disconnected from the NFT tech? And the more the journey of NFTs continue, I, I kind of stumble upon and know. <laughs> I feel like it can never because it's a marketplace asset whenever you release an NFT, whether you like it or not. Um, it, it, maybe, is, it is. It is. If you try and lock that or, or tam you know tamper with that, it sort of changes what the openness of the the space. Yeah, I, I've I've often found myself in the shower trying to put together the idea of a stable NFT, an NFT that holds its value and that has um, gamified mechanisms. So you imagine you have um, rodents, for instance. So you have rodents mm -hmm. which are a pest and they breed very very quickly. But also you need exterminators to keep the population in check. So you can have a community that breeds them and a community that exterminates them. And somewhere in the middle, you arrive at this defined and very stable value. Uh, and the intent incentives go up as the population rises too much and exterminators. So using the same kind of um, arbitrage mechanisms as you would use in a stablecoin system, but for stable NFTs. And then you could arrive at something that would be a, an agreed upon metaverse stable NFT value that can be used mm -hmm. anywhere. I think that would be a really interesting experiment. You could have them yeah. roaming the metaverse, these, these rodents, and then you could just snipe one off and then you would con be okay. contributing to the health of the metaverse. That would be a fun idea, right? right? That'd be pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so somebody go build it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I, I ain't building shit. It's too difficult. <laughs> you're, just, you're just the idea, man. I just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a vision, vision, you know. Yeah. But I, I keep saying these things in, in these, uh, in these shows because I'm hoping that somewhere somebody will go, oh, you know what? Maybe we could do that. That'd be fun. I'll be like, yep. You know, inception point. Well, listen, Matt, Matty, I, I don't want to hold you for too long because I know it's late where you are. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I really, I'm really curious to see where you're going to go. I know it's going to be a long journey from here to a fully playable version of new ganymede but um you know yeah 
excited for no, where man. you go next anyway. Thank you so much. No, we're excited to build it. Uh, no ideas are off the table. Um, I don't think anyone can see the trajectory of the Medici, even me, at this point. Whatever ideas that come up and whatever we decide to pursue and how the industry takes shape, no matter what project it is, whether it be the Medici or, you know, Board Ape, I think it, there's a handful of projects where if you connect to there's this journey that you're on, that's really exploring the Web3 space with this project and community. And I think that's what's important. So it's just happy to build and then see where we go. Awesome. Thanks, Matty. Hope to speak Thanks, to you man. soon. Take care, man. Cheers. Take Bye. Care.